And good evening, and welcome to yet another edition, another live edition of Scripture Night in America. I am Pastor Steve Wagner. You probably don't recognize me because I haven't been on the air in four weeks, at least live, but we are back live tonight. Yes, we're live. It is Wednesday, September 15th, 2021, here from Lombard, Illinois, with the text for this upcoming Sunday, which is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. And so we are going to get started with more live content tonight. I thank uh, everybody for uh, watching us the last couple of weeks while we uh, were on rebroadcast, and thanks to Lori for putting all that stuff together. But we are back in the saddle again and ready to take care of some live Bible study. So, um, like we said, our uh, this is for this coming Sunday's Old Testament lesson and Gospel lesson for the uh, 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and we'll jump right in with our theme, which is... Jesus was betrayed, yet humbly served us, as we are to serve each other. Jesus was betrayed, yet humbly served us, as we are to serve each other. All right, got a few people on. Lori's here, Robert's here, Jeff's here. Good to see everybody. Our Old Testament lesson that we're going to look at comes to us from Jeremiah 11. And our New Testament lesson is from Mark chapter 9. So, let's go ahead and jump in and put the first text on the screen and get started. Jeremiah 11 verses 18 through 20. The Lord made it known to me and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to slaughter. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges right, righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you, I ha for to you have I committed my cause." All right. <clears throat> Looking forward to some lively commentary and discussions from you guys tonight. So let's take a look at what's going on. Okay, so this is sort of another lament uh, from, <coughs> from Jeremiah. And, of course, he's known as the weeping prophet because uh, he did ministry in a very difficult time. So he was upset a lot of times. So... Notice the first thing that he says, he talks about in verse 18, the Lord made it known to me, and uh, you showed me their deeds. All right, what's he talking about? Well, throughout all of Jeremiah 11 prior to this section, Jeremiah had talked about how God is going to bring down judgment because remember, Jeremiah is dealing with a group of people that is way off on idolatry, way off on self-absorption, way off on uh, rejecting God in his ways and doing whatever, you know, they want to do. And uh, God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to call them to repentance. They aren't listening. Jeremiah is the next one. They haven't listened to Jeremiah. They're tired of him always harping on them, they feel. Won't leave him alone. Even the priests of the temple are going along with uh, the ways of the world and the ways of society. <clears throat> and so Jeremiah is trying to be God's voice to them, but they haven't been listening. So God had reached the point where he was going to uh, uh, bring about judgment for them. And of course, this is in the, uh, 
you know, the precursor to uh, the Babylonian captivity, which would get nasty for them. Um, so in reaction to Jeremiah's ongoing proclamation of judgment, they got sick and tired of listening to him, so they cooked up a plot to kill Jeremiah. Well, Jeff, you know, where is my bell? Hold on. Yes, Jeff, it sounds a lot like today because things don't change. Times change, <clears throat> and people may change, but the essence of who humanity is at its nature and the essence of who God is at his nature, that never changes. So God and man, by nature, are always going to be uh, at loggerheads with each other until you know, the last day in the new heaven and the new earth. So they had actually plotted to kill Jeremiah, and God told Jeremiah of the plot. God gave Jeremiah a heads up so that Jeremiah could take evasive action. <clears throat> now that shows us, one, that God is a protector and a provider. God had Jeremiah's back. And two, and perhaps more importantly... Uh, you would ask the question, why did God give Jeremiah this heads up? Hi, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. Glad to have you. Um, why would God give us this, uh, give him this heads up? Well, <clears throat> Jeremiah had been very faithful to God. Sorry about that, guys. God had been, uh, Jeremiah had been cutting out a lot today. Oh, I don't, I hope everyone else isn't seeing this. I, I don't know why I would be cutting out, to be honest. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> we'll see how this goes. But um, Jeremiah had been faithful to telling everybody God's word, God's truth, and God's truth, of course, creates repentance, creates faith. Uh, that's what God wants. And so because uh, God wanted his people to hear his word of law and gospel, he wanted Jeremiah to keep preaching. So God gave him the heads up. Let me know if this cutting out thing uh, gets better or not, guys. Um, then <clears throat> Jeremiah says, I was like a gentle lamb being led to slaughter. Okay, Jeff is okay. That's good news. Okay. <clears throat> so Jeremiah is asserting his innocence. I didn't do, I'm just an innocent little lamb, you know. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything to deserve this. So he's asserting that he, he doesn't deserve this fate, this plan that was being worked up against him. <clears throat> now, you would be really missing the boat. If you did not make the connection that is here between the fact that Jeremiah in this one instance, in this one situation, compares himself to an innocent lamb being led to slaughter, if you didn't compare that to the innocent Jesus, who was called the Lamb of God, who was also innocent but led to slaughter. <clears throat> and it's worth noting, and by the way, we'll be addressed in this coming Sunday sermon, should you watch our live stream at 9 a.m. Central Time this coming Sunday, that it's no accident that God, on one hand, the Father chose to spare Jeremiah from being slaughtered innocently, but did not spare his son from being slaughtered innocently. Now, there's a connection here to be made. We're not saying that Jeremiah is Christ-like, Messiah-like, God-like in any way. We don't want to take that connection too far, but the fact is, there is the point is worth making. <clears throat> that Jeremiah was innocent. He was being plotted to put to death unjustly. Jesus was innocent. He also was being plotted to be put to death unjustly. Jesus was betrayed. So here's the part of betrayal. 
Although Jeremiah didn't have to suffer the fate of being put to death for his teachings like Jesus did, this is how he humbly served us. So the first part of our theme is already coming into to play. Jesus was betrayed, yet he humbly served us. And of course, he served us by going to the cross to pay for our sins. God allowed Jesus to be slaughtered, though he was innocent, but he did not allow the same thing for Jeremiah. Okay. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, I did not know it was against me. I did not know. So, <clears throat> Jeremiah had no idea that this plot was being cooked up. Jeremiah would never have known. They would have probably succeeded and had Jeremiah put to death had God not intervened. But God intervened. And so, you know... I hate to get too far off into a rabbit hole about why did God um, intervene for Jeremiah, because on one hand, that's not really the bigger point of the whole thing in the first place. But in the second place, you know, John the Baptist was just as faithful of a prophet and a preacher as Jeremiah was, yet God didn't intervene to save him, yet he intervened to save Jeremiah. <clears throat> so, in a sinful world, bad things are going to happen. It's unavoidable. But the fact of truth is that this is one of those texts that does show us God loves us, God cares for us, He can protect us, and does protect us because He wants us uh, to be happy. Now, you know, sometimes, event eventually we all are going to pass away at some point. But that's not the way God wants it. And God here, I'm saying, uh, protected Jeremiah, not because there was something necessarily special about Jeremiah, but Jeremiah was faithfully preaching God's truth, and God did not feel that Jeremiah's time of doing so should have come to an end just yet in God's greater plan, like with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a faithful preacher of God's truth also, but... In God's grand wisdom, uh, he felt that the time had come to an end for John the Baptist. Lori, how then do we respond to someone who asks, was, why does God protect one and not another? That's sort of what we were talking about. And I know I got like a 30-second delay here before uh, your message popped up. Um, God doesn't play favorites. God loves everybody and everybody equally. Um, God does not provide there. And again, I'm giving you some, some talking points and some ground rules. If you want a hardcore answer to the question Lori just asked, there isn't one. We're not going to know that answer until we get to heaven. But uh, God loves everybody. Um, God doesn't play favorites. God occasionally provides protection for his children. God will occasionally provide protection and shelter for those who are in a state of unbelief and rejecting of him um at the end of the day you know god is always trying to manage and work everything towards an end that he will be glorified and he's glorified when more people are able to hear his word and come to repentance and faith um so why some and not others well we don't have access to god's grand plan we don't have access to his road map his blueprints and even if we did have access to them, we wouldn't understand them anyways. So we don't know. Um, but Lori's question is valid because it is a valid question, and it's going to get asked a lot. And so I was throwing these sort of talking points out there because, um, you know, at the end of the day, on one hand, we do have to be okay with, accepting an I don't know for an answer to a very difficult and legitimate question, but at the same time, um, the principles that are in play concerning God and his love for us never change. All right. So, then Jeremiah talks about how they were saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit, 
destroy the tree and cut him off from the land of the living. All right, so destroy the tree, be cut off from the land of the living. The people's intentions weren't merely to silence Jeremiah. The people's intentions weren't merely to remove Jeremiah from his position. The people's intentions clearly were to have Jeremiah put to death. They had murder on their hearts. And their desired outcome, it says, was that his name would be remembered no more. Remembered no more. They not only wanted to kill Jeremiah, they wanted every memory of him erased, and more importantly, it wasn't just Jeremiah that they wanted erased from memory. They wanted Jeremiah's teachings and preachings erased from memory. But, of course, the issue is the fact, okay, they've got a problem with Jeremiah's teachings. Well, God was the one that authored Jeremiah's teachings. So in reality, they don't have a problem with Jeremiah. They actually have a problem with God, God himself. Robert, verse 19 reminds me of the parable of the vineyard. Let me see verse 19. Lamb led to slaughter. Okay, yeah, that, that actually is a good connection to be made, Robert, because in the parable of the vineyard, um, the vineyard owner was sending his representatives to... Um, call the tenants, uh, call upon the tenants to conduct themselves in the way that they ought to be, and they responded by beating and killing all of the representatives. That's exactly, that's, that, that's good, Robert, very good. Um, so their, their hatred is directed towards God, and it's such a level of hatred that they, they not only want him, like I said, they, it's not good enough just to silence him, it's not good enough to remove him from office. And it's not even good enough that they kill him. They want him silenced, removed from office, killed, and remembered no more. Heavy stuff. But then, in verse 20, Jeremiah turns his discussions to God, and he says, he calls upon the Lord of hosts, Who judges rightly. Lord of hosts who judges rightly. God is always going to do what is just and what is right. Always, always, always. The irony in that truth is that we're able to proclaim that God will always do what is just and right because he unjustly treated Jesus. Because Jesus unjustly suffered the punishment and penalty of sin for the whole world, now God will deal with everyone in a just and right fashion. And that fashion essentially will be that everyone who repents of their sin uh, sets, denies themselves and uh, commits themselves to God's, uh, God's word and God's way and trust in Jesus' death and resurrection as payment for all of their sins, they will be forgiven. And of course, that's done by the power of the Holy Spirit, not as an act of human will. But 100% of the time, Anyone who, quote, deserves forgiveness, and again, you only deserve forgiveness through repentance and faith. But 100% of the time, the repentant faithful will be forgiven. All right. So he said, the Lord of hosts who judges rightly, and kind of piggybacking on what I just said, it says, he tests 
the heart and mind. He tests the heart and the mind. Okay, our actions will never save us. Why? Sure, we do some good, nice things on occasion. But sometimes we do some not-so-nice things. And the standard uh, for to please God and to deserve heaven is 100% perfection. If, you know, the first time you commit the first sin of thought, word, and deed, you have been disqualified, you are not worthy. And, of course, that ship left the harbor for all of us a mighty long time ago. So... It's not about being good enough, because nobody is. Rather, it's about, is the Holy Spirit in our minds and in our hearts creating repentance and creating faith? If the answer is yes, then God's going to forgive you, because that's what would be just in light of what happened to Jesus. So, God knows. He has his ways of knowing what's in our hearts and our minds. We don't know what's in each other's hearts and minds. This is why we shouldn't be judging uh, people and making judgments on salvation and such um, but God does and he does know and he does judge accordingly now the last statement there is a bit of a curious one let me see your vengeance upon them Let me see your vengeance upon them. Okay. That is curious because did not God command us to love our enemies and to pray for our enemies? Does God, does God not want everyone to repent and come to the saving knowledge of the truth and go to heaven? Yes, he does. Does God want to pronounce judgment and to seek vengeance for sin upon anybody? No, he doesn't. Yet Jeremiah, as an authorized, ordained, certified spokesman of God, is calling upon God to send down vengeance against these people. Without adding a little context to what Jeremiah says, it seems a little strange and inconsistent with biblical teaching. But... What, you know, the context to be added that explains this is that, like we said, God is always going to do what is just and what is right. Well, if someone does not repent, the just and right thing to do would be for God to condemn them and to judge them. Now, this is not Jeremiah wanting God to bring down the hammer and as a matter of personal revenge. That's not the issue. Jeremiah actually loves these people. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't have persistently tried to preach and preach and preach so that they would be changed. The issue is not that Jeremiah wanted God to uh, avenge the uh, damage and the plot against him. But rather, Jeremiah knows that they're unrepentant. So there's only one just solution in, in, that, in that scenario. If they had been repentant, if there was some chance to be repentant, that's not what Jeremiah would have asked for, and God wouldn't have done it anyways. So Jeremiah is wanting the hammer dropped, not because they made him mad, but because they won't repent. And that's what ends up happening when one doesn't repent. Repent. All right. That's our Old Testament lesson. Again, look at our theme. Jesus was betrayed, yet humbly served us, as we are to serve each other. Now, the part about Jesus being betrayed is sort of uh, couched in the Jeremiah 11 because this uh, is a connection, a foreshadowing of the innocent Jesus being put to death, although it had a different ending than it did for Jeremiah. But Mark 9 talks about the loving and serving each other part, and we're about to dive into that now. Now, um, as I'm getting ready to read the New Testament, uh, can somebody 
Um, chime in and let me know how the audio feed is because I don't know why it would have been cutting out. And um, I want to make sure that that is not an issue. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about Mark 9 verses 30 through 37. So we'll put that up on the screen. All right, where are we at? They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And Jesus sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, Jesus said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. All right, so, um, all right, Lisa's good, Robert's good, Jeff is good, and Lori thinks she has issues with one device, so we might be in decent shape. Okay. So let's talk about, there's actually two sort of sections here. Um, first, Jesus started talking about passing through Galilee. Passing through Galilee. Um... This part of Mark, Mark 9, is a little bit of a transitional chapter. And by that I mean that there's a change in that we're not focusing, after, from this point going forward, there's not as much of a focus on Jesus' miracles and his healing and all the great stuff Jesus can do, like has been the primary focus thus far in Mark, but instead the changing is from the healing miracles to his journey to Jerusalem and the cross. There's a lot more in this last part of Mark going forward that is focused on Jesus' upcoming passion. So that's a little bit of a change. So you can see, okay, they're going through Galilee because they're leaving the area and they're about to head into Jerusalem. Now, it's no coincidence that the first part of Mark chapter 9 uh, was Mark's account of the transfiguration. Now, understand the structure here of Mark because the transfiguration is like the ultimate identity of Jesus as the Son of God, as God in flesh. When he starts glowing with whiteness, I mean, there's no arguing. And I've said repeatedly that the whole point of all of his miracles that he performed, two points, two, two uh, reasons he did them, proof and mercy. <clears throat> One, he, he wanted to help people and heal people because God is, he's, Jesus is a merciful God. But also proof. Proof that he was who he claimed to be, and he claimed to be nothing short of the Son of God in flesh. Okay? Well, all of these miracles, he'd been saying he was the Son of God. The miracles were proving he's the Son of God. Then the transfiguration is the ultimate proof that he is the Son of God, undeniable proof that he is the Son of God. So now that that fact has been firmly established, notice the structure again, it built up, built up, built up to the transfiguration. Well, now it's time to sort of shift gears. And now we've got something different we're going to talk about. 
He didn't want anyone to know. You've seen him say this before. A uh, couple of reasons for it at this particular juncture. One, the, uh, the one reason why Jesus always says, don't tell nobody, keep this quiet, is because he is trying to manage um, his time in that, you know, the more of an uproar that's created by his teachings and his miracles and the things that he does, the more that uproar is created, the more the, the closer he's getting to the cross. Because, you know, the people who love Jesus love him all the more. The people who reject Jesus despise him all the more. And eventually, <clears throat> you know, push comes to shove and he goes to the cross. But he had to go to the cross at the right time and at the right place. And this is not yet the time or the place. So he's trying to kind of keep the brakes on stuff a little bit. Now, then he makes the statement, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Jesus is predicting his death on Good Friday, which again makes sense because we're starting to transition more to a focus on that in Mark at this point. Now, this is the second time of three that Jesus, in Mark, that Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. It happens in Mark 8. This is Mark 9. He does it once more in Mark 10. So it's sort of setting the table for what is about to happen. Now, he makes a statement. They're going to kill him. And he starts out the next sentence and when he is killed, and I say that because he pointed out within a sentence and a half that he's going to be killed twice. He said it twice. He points out twice, I will be killed. Okay, that's emphasis. And, you know, one, he wants them to understand... Um, he wants them to understand that he is about to be put to death and the implications of it. But two, the fact that he's emphasizing it so much is um, he wants them to understand the violent nature by which he is going to be put to death. And it, you know, it has to be violent. I, I remember the question once being asked to my old... Uh, my old pastor, uh, before I went to seminary back home in Texas, the question was asked, you know, this is like in the wake of the, relief of the, the release of the movie The Passion of the Christ. And if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, you have seen how gory and violent and graphic and bloody uh, and hard to watch it is. Yet, that's a pretty realistic depiction of what happened to Jesus that day. And the question was asked, <clears throat> why did it have to be that bad? You know, why did Jesus have to, why did they have to, you know, crown of thorns on his head and hit him with whips with hooks that tore his flesh off and nailed to a cross? Why couldn't he have just come today and get like a lethal injection or a firing squad or something where death is a lot quicker and a lot less painful? And his answer was, Jesus' death was going to be the full atoning, atoning payment for all of the sins of all the entire world, of all time, all people, past, present, future. Well, if you're going to tackle that, that's an awful lot of sin. So that would require an awful lot of suffering. And, you know, when you meditate on what Jesus has done on the cross for us, it's worth noting that he knew how bad it was going to be. He knew the pain he was going to suffer. There was no surprise whatsoever uh, for Jesus on Good Friday, yet he chose to do it anyways. Jesus was God. He could have bailed on that. He didn't have to go through all that, but 
He knew if he didn't go through all that, you and I and every other person would end up burning in hell for eternity. We wouldn't be good enough to go to heaven, and there's only one other option. So, but then, you know, he brings not only the bad news of Good Friday, but the good news of Easter. After three days, he will rise. He will rise in three days. So Easter is Jesus' victory over sin and death, and that's the basis of our salvation. Now again, you know, seeing how the cards all played out, and looking at the apostles as Jesus' hand-picked spiritual leaders, and the first pastors, leaders of the church, he told them over and over, I'm going to rise on the third day. And yet on Easter, nobody remembered that. Um, so it goes to show that when anything good happens in a ministry, it is all about Jesus and his work. It is not about ours. Most certainly not. All right. And it says they did not understand the saying. And you know that because as you're going to see in this next passage, well, it's already been read, um, their focus is on worldly glory, their worldly situation. And it's not on Jesus' message which transcends worldly glory. Much, much bigger. So then the next section... Jesus confronts him. What were you discussing on the way? He knew what they were discussing on the way because he's God and he knows everything. And he knew that they he knew that they were overly focused on themselves. And that's a problem. But again, like we have seen repeatedly, Jesus isn't going to lower the hammer but rather he's going to work to correct the problem, lead them to repentance, and then faith, and then forgiveness. So he's calling them out, not to shame them, but to work them towards repentance. But when he asked them, it said they kept silent. So they now all of a sudden realize, oh, you know what, we shouldn't have been having that discussion, and he knows about it, so they were too guilty and ashamed to even admit it. Now, when you compare this account with the account told in Matthew, which is in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 6, I don't know if Phyllis is here, but I know she always appreciates a good Matthew reference when she is. Um, <clears throat> in Matthew 18, 1 through 6, the disciples actually went to Jesus asking them, which one of us is the greatest? And that probably was because Jesus, in the Matthew account, doesn't record Mark's uh, account of Jesus asking them what they were talking about. Matthew just says, well, they asked Jesus the question, who's the greatest? Mark doesn't record them asking Jesus who's the greatest, but it does record them record Jesus asking them what you guys talking about. So you put those two pieces together, what probably happened is that Jesus uh, asked them the question they didn't want to fess up, and Jesus probably had to push, 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 and finally they're like, okay, which one of us is the greatest? Jeff, the sinful nature is always at work and can't be stopped on this side of heaven. You are correct, sir. Um... So then it says they had argued about each other as to who was the greatest. Muhammad Ali would probably have loved to have been in that discussion because he said he was the greatest. And in the boxing ring he might have been. But that's not what we're talking about here. You see the problem. Okay? They're focused on themselves. Now, if you, I didn't, I didn't teach live last week, but if you uh, watched our my, the sermon from this past Sunday, 
You remember the section of the uh, of Mark right before this, where the father had brought the demon possessed boy to the disciples to cast out the demon, but the disciples couldn't do it. And then a big scene came out because the scribes are arguing with them. Well, you guys are a bunch of frauds. Well, wait just a minute. And uh, the disciples asked Jesus, "Well, how come we weren't able to cast that demon out?" And Jesus said, this one can only be casted out by prayer. In other words, you guys haven't been praying because you guys have been focused on yourselves. You guys have lost sight of the fact that you don't have any strength in and of yourself. The strength you have comes from me. But you've been focusing on yourselves instead of me, Jesus says. Well, here you go again, right? This is continuing that exact same theme on and on. And so um, Jesus is trying to address it. Now, it's startling that this happens literally in the next breath after Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. One would think that such a shocking uh, thing being said would kind of grab their attention, but clearly it did not, because like Jess says, this is how the sinful nature works. It's pretty stubborn. And it makes you wonder, this was very shortly after Mark's account of the transfiguration earlier in Mark 9. Now look at what happened at the transfiguration. Jesus only took three of the apostles up on the mountain with him. Peter, James, and John. The other twelve, did, all twelve did not get invited. And when they got back, Peter, James, and John didn't do a whole lot of talking. So, could there have been feelings of jealousy? Could there have been feelings of insecurity? It's curious that this fight breaks out right in the wake of the transfiguration, and some of them might have felt a little slighted and what, what have you. So you could sort of, from a humanistic perspective, see this brewing. Now another little side note. We said in three times in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus predicts his death. When Jesus predicts his death in the Gospel of Mark, the exact same pattern happened every time. One, Jesus predicts his passion. Two, the apostles all three times responded with concern for worldly glory. And three, Jesus called for self-denial and service to others. And self-denial and service to others is literally the polar opposite of worldly glory. All right? Now Jesus closes by saying, if anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. So, you know, heaven has a different view on what is greatness than the world does. In heaven, greatness and being first is defined by self-denial and loving service of others. So here we go with our theme. We are to love and serve each other as Jesus humbly loved and served us with his death and resurrection after being betrayed. So Jesus gives them the object lesson. He puts the child in front of them. And the child, especially in those days, was symbolic of helplessness and insignificance in that culture. And so that would have said something by Jesus saying... Um, you know, this child is, uh, you know, is the model for what you should be looking at. This child is the model for heavenly greatness. Jesus said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So in other words, Jesus says that uh, what a person's attitude towards a child, insignificant, helpless, is going to define their attitude towards Jesus. What you think of this child is what you think of me. So Jesus is linking himself to this child. And, you know, again, in the eyes of the world, Jesus would be viewed as insignificant and helpless, especially hanging on a cross, bloodied and beaten and dying. What good is this going to do? But again, there's more to it than meets the eye. And then Jesus says, whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. So that is to say that Jesus says that whatever your attitude is towards him is going to define what your attitude is towards the Father in heaven. So by the associative property of mathematics, Jesus says what you think about this child 
governs what you think about me. And what you think about me governs what you think about the Father. Therefore, what you think about this child defines your attitude towards the Father in heaven. Okay. So let's go ahead, put a bow on it, and wrap it up. So tying it all together. The world rejects Jesus and everyone who proclaims his message. Jesus suffered just like we suffer. But Jesus' betrayal and suffering on the cross is the reason that we've been set free from sin. So since we've now been set free from sin by that act of love, we should love and serve each other as God, as Jesus loved and served us. Jeremiah 11 tells us about Jeremiah being plotted against to be put to death, foreshadowing Jesus' plotting to be put to death, though they both were innocent. And Mark 9 tells us about Jesus proclaiming his upcoming death and resurrection and the apostles responding to it by focusing not on that powerful message but on themselves. And that led Jesus to change their focus from self to each other. So though we sin and though we are sinned against, we are forgiven in Christ through his suffering. And his Holy Spirit leads us to think of others first before ourselves. That's our message for today. Well, again, I'm, uh, I thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, I know it's been quite a break. Uh, it's been several weeks, but uh, we're back. And I, I don't, thinking ahead, I don't foresee any uh, breaks in the action until possibly uh, Thanksgiving, maybe, unless something happens to come up. But we want to... Um, we want to invite you to join us this coming Sunday, as always, at 9 a.m. Central Time, originating here from Trinity Lutheran Church in Lombard, Illinois. We will be live streaming our next worship service. And uh, if you're in the area, please join us. And uh, next Wednesday, I'll be back again with another live uh, content, more live content, uh, live streaming next week's adult Bible study. So I thank all of you for joining us. Uh, let's get back in the mode of uh, coming together on Wednesday evenings. Let's get back in the mode of telling others about our study, sharing it uh, with others on your Facebook page or however you may share it. We would love to go back to growing the audience because we were pulling some pretty doggone good numbers before I took a break. So let's build back up to that. Uh, so I thank all of you for joining us, and I do look forward to seeing you Sunday morning in in uh, worship and next Monday e or next Wednesday evening for adult Bible study. May the Lord richly bless your evening.